Well, I know we have only just finished baseball season and we are now well into football season, but for those who follow lesser sports, it might be worth remembering that the New York Marathon was run just two Sundays ago. The winner in the men's division ran the race in two hours and four minutes. The women's finisher, first place finisher, ran it in two hours and 26 minutes. If you want to feel really, really inadequate, the winner of the men's wheelchair division did 26.2 miles in an hour and 25 minutes. I can't even imagine driving around 26 miles of New York City in an hour and a half. You probably couldn't. Well, good for them. These are, these are remarkable accomplishments. It makes us wonder, well, what do people do? How, how do they even prepare for this sort of thing? And of course, there's a lot of training and skill and, and, and time that goes into getting ready to do that sort of thing. It comes down, in a way, to just how do you manage what you've been given, the gifts you have? In some ways, those gifts are things you can't really control entirely. The winner of the men's division is an Ethiopian named Tamirat Tola who is 32 years old, he's 5 feet 11 and weighs 130 pounds. Indeed, all of the finishers, the top three finishers in the men's and women's divisions were Kenyans and Ethiopians, uh, for whatever that may mean. They, they dominate in the sport. But it seems like it's more about what each of those individual people did with the gifts that he or she had been given, and how he or she managed a literal weight in that case, but also the, the more sort of metaphorical weight of training and psychology and everything else that goes into being able to run a very, very long distance. Certainly, uh, it's discouraging to those of us who perhaps don't weigh 130 pounds anymore to think of even doing that sort of thing, but maybe there's a little bit of hidden encouragement in it. It turns out that in amateur racing, in, among those who don't run at quite such an elite level, there are other categories for runners. In, among men, it's called Clydesdales. Among women, it's called Athenas. I don't really know what the cutoff is for women, but for men, you have to weigh at least 200 pounds to run as a Clydesdale. So it isn't really even about mass so much as how you manage it and what you're using it for, how you have it organized on that day, and how your head is able to tell the rest of you what it is you're going to do. Certainly, it's, it's dangerous, I think, in some ways to get too far away from that idea. I, as speaking as one who has moved 24 times in my life, I know about what everything I own weighs. Because every time you move, the moving company comes and they charge you based on the weight of your possessions. It's worrying to have your entire life reduced to just a number in that way. But it's also a useful reminder of how much junk I'm dragging around in my life. And a useful occasion every time I do move to stop and think, how much of this weight do I use routinely? How much of this weight am I not making good use of? How much of it is really just slowing me down as I try to lug it along behind me as I go through my life? There is something of that in what Jesus is telling his listeners and is telling us this morning, I think. It's tempting for us as 21st century people to imagine that when this man went away and gave out his property to his employees, slaves, servants, whoever they may have been, uh, he gave them a debit card. But in reality, he didn't, because a talent is a unit of weight, not a unit of money. It was different in different countries. I actually spent some fascinating time looking this up this week. But what Jesus was talking about, the, the talent he was referring to, probably worked out to about 130 pounds, which coincidentally is the weight of the winner of the New York City Marathon for those playing at home. And if you need something more realistic to attach that to, a talent of apples, for example, based on what Acme is charging this morning, would cost about $400, would be worth about $400. A talent of gold on the spot market this morning would be worth about $3.8 million. So differences in value, but also differences in what we have to do with them, what our head says we need to do. If I keep a talent of gold for a thousand years, it will look exactly the same at the end as it does now. If I keep a talent of apples for a week, it will no longer be useful for much of anything. 
So there is something in that, that weightiness, that calls us to think about what we're doing with the gifts that we have been given, what it is that we're lugging around with us, and whether indeed lugging is even the word we should be using. Because what Jesus is really trying to point us toward are the gifts that God has given us, which may feel weighty, but if we're using them properly, should be so productive, so fruitful in the world, they should seem entirely worth whatever the effort is it takes for us to carry them around. That's all a lovely history lesson and something fascinating to think about this week, and I could sit down and say amen, but of course I won't. Because the obvious next thing to ask is, well, yeah, so what? So then, how then shall we live? What does any of this mean? As I go through my daily life, how is it that I'm supposed to be thinking about the gifts I have been given and whether I'm using them appropriately? Here again, I have to go back to running, one of my favorite subjects. It comes down, I think, to equipment and training. If you ever go to any sizable race, 10K race, half marathon, marathon, whatever it is, just try not to become distracted by the shoes. If you look around, everybody has on a different pair of shoes. I've never understood this. There's a limited number of manufacturers of shoes. They can't be making new varieties every week, and yet everybody's shoes look different. And in part, the reason for that is because running has become so scientific that when you go into a store that sells running shoes, you can't just buy a pair of running shoes. First, you have to go through a gauntlet of answering a thousand questions how often you run, how far you run, how your feet hit the ground, what kind of insoles, your, your, your instep you have, do you have a good arch, do you have a bad arch, how are your knees, how are your ankles, all these are things you have to talk about before they'll bring out five or six pairs for you to try on and go run on the sidewalk to see which one works for you the best. The same is true with clothes. Early in my running career, I used to run in cotton t-shirts in the south in the summer. It didn't take me long to realize that cotton soaks up sweat and then it doesn't dry. And in line with the theme of this whole sermon, you're then carrying around the literal weight of your own sweat, reminding yourself of the effort you're making and unable even to get away from it. You can't run away from your own sweat. Make that the tagline for the sermon this week. And the same is true with training. I was talking to people from 8 o'clock between services. They were asking why it is that I haven't run any marathons. I've done half marathons, but never the whole thing. It's because the training is so intense to run a marathon. If you're not going to injure yourself, which I would do, because that would be my luck, you have to run miles and miles and miles for weeks and weeks and weeks beforehand in order to be in good enough training to do it safely. So there's something about being in training all the time, keeping a schedule, keeping a, a journal, keeping records of what you do and how you felt and what pace you went at and all those other things. So you can be checking, am I getting where I need to go? Am I doing what I'm intending to do? Is this working out the way I mean it to? All those things work for us in our spiritual lives too, both as individuals and as Christian communities. And St. Paul is getting at this a little bit in this one line in the, the epistle lesson from this morning. Apparently, it was a theme he likes because he does it two or three times, items of clothing and what their spiritual significance may be. Today, it's just, what, helmet and breastplate. Other times, you get sandals and swords and gauntlets, and I don't know what else he has in there, but it's something like that, isn't it? It's about what we surround ourselves with, what we put on at least in a spiritual way, if not always in a literal way. There are things that we should be putting on. And he lists them there, our, our faith, our hope in the future, our trust in God, our charity, our, our generosity, our desire to heal the world and to heal our community around us, and our desire to be healed ourselves in the process. And things that it doesn't help to put on, like a cotton t-shirt, if we're putting on fear, if we're putting on nervousness about how what we do may turn out if everything doesn't go perfectly, if we're putting on stinginess, which is a form of fear, 
we're not going to be able to run very far. We're weighed down by our heavy shoes and our sweaty shirt. So choosing the right equipment is really, really important. And then once we have it on, we turn to training. Here I have something to report from the, the convention of the diocese. Yesterday, we heard a lot about the bishop's blueprint for the future. He rolled this out last year, but it really began to get some traction this year. A five-year plan for where he would like us as a group of Christians in Delaware to be by the time we get to the end of the five years that begin now and end in 2028. None of it is, well, we're going to achieve this specific thing and we're going to have this specific measurable... Uh, but it gives us a lot of ideas of what we ought to be doing as far as the way we train our souls and train our attentions as communities to better live what it is God intends us to live, to be whom God intends us to be. So there are three main areas in the bishop's blueprint. They are discipleship, service, and growth. All of those sound like good things, but you know, so what? what are, what's in that? What does that even mean? Well, by discipleship, what I think he's pointing us toward, what we should be thinking about, is how we deepen our relationship with Jesus, both as individuals and collectively. How is it that we stay in training to be able to be good disciples of Jesus? Well, we do those things here. We have those opportunities here. There is a Bible study here every Wednesday at 10.30. A weekly opportunity to dig into Holy Scripture with other Christians. To have some of the not rough, rough edges knocked off our understanding of what the Scripture says. And to hear what other people are doing in their faith lives. We have ongoing opportunities on Sunday mornings for Christian formation for children and for adults. We've only just finished a session on Christianity in America. Before that, it was the Desert Fathers and Mothers. Now, next, it's going to be the, the rule of St. Benedict in January. After that, we're going to talk about Christianity and mental health. On and on and on. And this is just the, the, the latest few things in a long series of things that we have done, not just to have something entertaining to hear about on Sunday morning, but to give the Holy Spirit an opportunity to, opportunity to unlock one more room in our hearts, where perhaps we've never even been and where there may be a treasure we have never even found. If we don't do that, how can we possibly hope to share any of it? If we are not good disciples, how can we hope to explain to anybody else what the, the nature of our own faith is? Why do you keep going to that place on Sunday morning? Why won't you do whatever fill-in-the-blank unethical thing? Well, let me tell you, that's usually where Episcopalians get just a little sweaty in the palm because it starts to sound a little too much like evangelism. But if we understand it as being the way that we run the race we've been training for, it looks a little different. The next major area is service. If I live to be 100 and I'm still doing this when I'm 100, I will still be calling congregations that I think it's much too easy for us to hide in this place. Come in here on Sunday morning and do what we do and go away and hope nobody ever noticed. It's really only when we get out of this place that we are able to truly live our Christian lives. We're fed here, we're, we're equipped here, we're built up and supported here but somehow it's only when that stuff gets out into the world, when we meet people who don't even necessarily look very churchy, that we begin to discover something about ourselves and them and God and what it is that God intends for all of humanity. Part of that is the work of racial justice and reconciliation. We heard a lot about that at convention also. We see the beginnings of work for justice happening here or new beginnings of work for justice here. It's been going on here for a long time. In the work that Father Clay has done with uh, the cafe, he met this week with representatives from the Delaware Food Bank. A new connection 
toward helping with the cafe. And not simply help, helping with the cafe, but providing a certain opportunity to someone who otherwise might not have it. To come run a kitchen where the stakes are fairly low. The people are nice. They're nice. Smile and say, yes, they're nice. Yes, yes they're nice. <laughs> the live stream system, bringing in young people. What we do here on Sunday morning is a, a, a relatively bargain basement sort of, of TV broadcast, meaning no disrespect to those who do it. You do wonderful work. These are the beginnings of skills that can turn into even more sophisticated things. I've been trying this week to record little... Uh, videos for Advent to send out every day during Advent. And I realized I can't get the production quality I want because I have grown up watching television. I know what television looks like. Suddenly I'm learning how much there is you have to know to make it look like television looks. Here we're beginning to offer someone a chance to begin to acquire those skills. What a wonderful opportunity. It doesn't even seem very churchy. And yet the opportunity opportunity to offer opportunity, to build relationships, to get out of our doors and invite people in is a wonderful thing. And it's only when we begin to make those connections with people who don't think of themselves as churchy and begin to discover the things that we share that the Holy Spirit will really be unleashed among us. Come next month on December 10th, one of our state representatives will be here to talk about criminal justice and incarceration. I can hear some worldly voices saying, less nothing church people should get involved with. You're out there, you're a citizen. You're in here, you're a religious person. No. It's exactly what church people should be doing. I hope a whole bunch of non-churchy people will be brave enough to walk through the red door to talk to us about it, to talk with us about it, to begin to build a coalition around it, or at least invite us into the ones they already have. Connections, dear friends, service to the world. What a wonderful way to talk back to those who say the church is dead and just hasn't stopped moving yet. Because all of that leads to that third item, growth. When we hear that word, often what we think about is literal people in the pews who can come and do stuff with us, or worse yet, do stuff for us. Among other things that was discussed at the convention was the, the review of sort of the, the work of the diocese and the bishop that has been conducted over the last year. One of the themes that came out in that is worry about attrition in congregations, the, small, the, the smaller size of congregations, the older average age of the population in congregations. And so part of it is thinking about what it means to grow. And yes, some of that ought to be that what we are doing here is really good work and really ought to be attracting other people who, to want to come do it with us. They may not always be on Sunday morning. Lately, we've been doing some sly ways of attracting people into our community, like blessing of the animals. What a wonderful, low-pressure way. Bring your pets to the church. We're not going to make you stand up, sit down, use the right book, wear the right clothes, know the right things to say every minute. All you have to do is follow your dog around. The church bazaar. What a lovely opportunity to come and get some cookies. We're going to do a dinner in December in honor of St. Thomas. It's going to have an Indian theme because, by tradition, St. Thomas was martyred in India. We're beginning to reach out to all the Indian student groups on campus and to some of our Blue Hen Bounty friends who are Indian. Will they come and help us make it authentic? Again, no one's going to try to splash them with holy water when they walk in the door. But we'll build a relationship with them. That may be the growth we should be looking for. Yes, of course, we should be doing what the, the in the propagandistic words of this uh, document is called joyful invitation. Now I will embarrass Terry. We take lots of pictures of our events. Everything we do, we're really good at 
the crass word is publicity. And the Invite Welcome Connect Committee of the diocese invited every parish in the diocese to put together a little video that would say, here's how we're inviting you to come join us. There were only three churches in the diocese that did it. And only one of them got their video shown at convention yesterday. And yes, it was St. Thomas's, for which we have to thank Terry very much. What a lovely thing that was to see all the things we've done. I'd forgotten some of it. I mean, there were candids of me, and I never allow candid pictures. So clearly, someone was watching what was going on, even when I was being completely unselfconscious. What a wonderful metaphor for the way we should be doing church. All of this, dear friends, feeds into our growth and the growth of those around us. It's not merely about numbers in seats, but also the depth of our faith, the depth of the way we express our faith. What a wonderful thing, an important thing. Because if we don't do it, who will? I got a little nervous this week reading different versions of this lesson. As you may know, different translations will use different words for the same thing. And I knew I probably should not go to the message. This is Eugene Peterson, the well-known biblical scholar and Presbyterian minister, who wrote a, an entirely modern language Bible. It's quite an, quite an accomplishment. I went to his version of it, and this is how he ends his version of this story when the, the boss has come back and is settling up with the, the underlings talking about the third, the third one who just buried the treasure and did nothing with it. Says, the master was furious. That's a terrible way to live. It's criminal to live cautiously like that. Take the thousand that he had and give it to the one who risked the most and get rid of this play it safe who won't go out on a limb. Throw him out into utter darkness. It's risky. We can't play it safe. God didn't play it safe with us. God took a big risk on humanity. And God calls us to do the same. So, dear friends, I call us to be in training all the time. How many miles have we run today? How was our diet this week spiritually? How well are our spiritual shoes fitting? Do we need new ones? The race is long. We have been given everything that we need. We can easily bear what it is God has laid upon us if we will only do it in God's spirit and in God's way. Amen.